In this video, I want to talk with you about why it's so important to use God's language. The first thing I want to say to you is if you don't use God's language, you won't understand his concepts, you will not understand your condition, and you will not know how to heal, period. And healing is synonymous with salvation. So not only will you not heal here on earth, but you are ultimately not going to understand the healing of your soul that is required in order for you to be saved. You are working out your salvation. You are working out your healing, being healed of the curse. And it's not that anything that you do is necessarily going to be the thing that heals you from that curse, but it will justify you. It will justify you on the last day. What you have done in your heart is going to justify you as to whether you are going to be an object of his wrath or an object of his mercy. So if you're not being moved and if you're not picking this up, and if you're using the language of the world, you're going to be handed over to delusion. I can tell you that 100%. I know it from personal experience and I know it from watching others. I got on a phone call today with a friend and, you know, we were talking, asking, how are you doing? And one of the first things she said to me is, I'm depressed. And she also happens to be someone who was trained as a psychologist in the same field that I was trained in and knows that it's baloney. And so we have a really good uh, just a blessing to me. Our relationship is a blessing because it's one other person, one other person in this entire world who's saying, yeah, this is garbage. This is not true. This did not lead to healing. One other person who is the voice of reason. But my friend did say that she is depressed. And so we started talking about that. Here's the problem. When you start saying I'm depressed or you say that I have PTSD, what is your solution? What's the solution to those syndromes and conditions? Well, you got to go to therapy, right? Or you got to take a medication. There's no understanding that God is dealing with you on something. As we started to talk, I said, well, so what do you think it really is? Because I said, you know, if you're going to heal, you have to stop using that language. You cannot use the language of the world. You need to describe what's actually going on based on God's word. She started to describe what was going on. And I said, that's godly grief. You're feeling godly grief because he's raising things to the surface that you're becoming aware of which is good. That's actually a good sign that he's moving you in that way. Now, if you know that God is giving you godly grief, then you can bet that he loves you, that right now you're not an object of his wrath. Right now, he's moving you because he loves you. He's disciplining the one he loves. But if you continue to spurn him and you don't return to him, what's going to happen? You will become an object of his wrath. So when Paul was saying you are saved if you endure to the end, if you continue to believe in the gospel that was preached to you, if you are bearing this fruit, he was saying by the fruit that you are bearing right now, I can tell you what category you're in. But should that fruit change, for example, should you fall, should you stop believing in the gospel that was preached to you, should you become bewitched by some other false doctrine, well, it was a false alarm. You're not one of the ones. If you've already been saved, how can that change? How could that possibly change? How could there be a contingency in Paul's statement if you've already been saved? Explain that one to me. The only explanation for that is what Peter said, you're working out your salvation, is what Paul said, I have to obey the very things I say to you lest I disqualify myself. How could you be disqualified? Well, if you're working out your salvation and you haven't received it yet, and by the way, what are you being saved from? If you've already been saved, what are you still doing here? We're being saved from this world and from the curse. And that has not happened yet because we're still here and we're still in this condition. Otherwise, you would have been changed already. But as it is during the resurrection, those who participate in the resurrection will be changed in the twinkling of an eye. Then you're going to know that you've been saved. You weren't saved because you got dunked underwater. And you weren't saved because you declared with your lips that you believe in Jesus Christ. Because many of us, myself included, did not even know what it meant to believe in Jesus Christ. Didn't even know what it meant that we were getting baptized or that we should have been repenting. Because there are worthless shepherds on this earth who are only concerned about adding one more notch in their belt and one more offering on counterfeit Sabbath Sunday. Now let's talk about using the language of God. What is your solution? If you have a syndrome that the world tells you is a syndrome, something that you're battling, that's not what you're battling. You're battling Satan in your flesh. You're not battling a syndrome. You're battling to find your way back to God. And all of those syndromes and diagnoses are a distraction 
from your true condition, from what God has told you is actually going on inside of you. And if you don't believe that, then you don't believe in him. How could you possibly believe in him? He sent his son to show you what the spiritual condition is. He sent his son to tell you, you need to repent. He said for thousands of years, even before sending his son, return to me and I will heal you. I am the Lord, your healer. If you obey me, I will not put on you any of the diseases that I put on the Egyptians. He has given you instruction. And counterfeit Christianity has a habit of acting like he just dropped us off here and said, fend for yourself, kid. Figure it out. And so then he blessed us with science, right? Because we were so righteous pursuing this false god and turning away from everything that he established. Then he sent us science. Sure. The one that denies that he even exists. When you know that what you're experiencing is godly grief, because part of what my friend was telling me is that she's become very aware that the person she thought she was as a Christian is not who she is. And that in the process of fasting and returning to God, God's been showing her that. That's a good thing, guys, because that means if he's disciplining you, he loves you. But you have to know where to go with it. And if you think that you're depressed over it, then it's just a distraction. If you know that what you're feeling is godly grief or godly sorrow, then you know that the word says, oh, I know what this is. Godly sorrow means I've been grieving the Holy Spirit. It means I'm feeling the sadness of the Holy Spirit over who I've been. And I need to be reconciled to him. I need to repent and I need to be reconciled to the spirit of God inside of me because I've been fighting him. I've been battling him. I've been grieving him. I've been making God sad. And now I'm feeling that sadness. And you know what? It's not something to be upset about. It's something to rejoice in. Is that weird or what? It's something to delight in because now he has caused you to realize who you've been, what you've been doing, and what needs to happen. You don't get that solution in psychology or psychiatry or medicine. You just get a bunch of syndromes and a bunch of distractions that cause you to, to go further and further away from what God is actually calling you into. Because now you're trying to figure out how to get your depression under control. Now you're trying to figure out how to get your flashbacks and your PTSD under control. You have no understanding. And then once I do that, then I can serve God. Really? No, it's never going to happen. You're never going to get it under control. People don't heal from those things. It's a lie. It's such an outright lie. I, ha I at least have the world credentials to tell you that it is a lie. I was in it. I participated in it for almost 30 years of my own therapy. It's a lie. I got a doctorate in it. I've treated hundreds of patients of all ages. There's no healing. The thing that they say is healing is not healing. You need to understand what you're dealing with and you need to use the language of God. For this reason, I want to tell you the fulfillment. So this is a scheme. It's a tactic of the enemy. So you don't know about what causes your healing, you know, your physical or mental healing here. Because you don't understand that it's spiritual in etiology. You don't understand because you're not using God's language. You're not returning to truth and you're handed over to delusion. Let's talk about it on a larger scale on the things that are important to God. And the thing ultimately that's important to God is your salvation, that you understand salvation. That's why he established physical and mental healing so that you could understand that your body and your mind are manifesting the spiritual and emotional condition of your soul. Okay. Is my friend experiencing the spiritual and emotional condition of her soul? Yeah. She's grieved over who she's been. And she's also experiencing grief and sorrow of the Holy Spirit and of being separated from the Holy Spirit. She needs to be reconciled. And once she's reconciled, that feeling that she's calling depression is going to go away because now she's going to feel integrated in the way that her soul is designed to be in God. Let's talk about what happens when people start using language that God has not used regarding the resurrection, which is used 52 times in the Bible. Rapture is used two times and never describes the resurrection. It describes being caught up. It's not talking about the resurrection in either context. So why is it that we are using rapture which God has not used for that event. He's used it as a concept of being caught up, but not even used in the context of resurrection. But resurrection being used 52 times in the Bible 
is not being used to describe the first resurrection. Why? Is that a scheme and tactic of the devil? I just illustrated for you that it is. Don't use the language God has used. And that way, no one can look it up for themselves. That way, they have to depend and rely on man to tell them what the word says. Well, I have God's spirit and I have his word. I don't need man to educate me. God has already empowered me to be educated by him. And in order for me to be educated by him, I need to use his language. I need to use his concepts and pursue his heart and what he has established. For that very reason, when I'm doing a Bible study with you, I say things like, let's see how God used this word in a sentence. Do I rely on Strong's to tell me what that word means? No, you've seen me multiple times say, this is so insufficient. It's so insufficient to look at what Strong says about this, to look at their interpretation. But when I'm looking at the way God used that word in a sentence, now I can actually understand the concept because I'm pursuing him. So what's going to happen when people are not using his language? They're not going to understand the first resurrection and everything that is written about it 52 times in the Bible. And they're going to start making up doctrines and pursuing doctrines that tell them what their itching ears want to hear. And you know what's going to happen? They're not going to orient their heart around what God wants them to do because they're so invested in this false doctrine that they're going to be picked up before they ever have to endure anything. You got to use God's language. You want to understand your covenant? Then use his language. You want to understand salvation? Then use his language. When God says that his people perish from lack of knowledge, it's not because knowledge is not accessible to them. It is because they have rejected truth. And they reject truth in all kinds of ways. They pursue man's doctrines, man's sermons, and they don't read the word and they don't ask him questions and they don't have a relationship with him. And they follow people who make it seem like there's a way in which we could just figure God out. You know, I posted a video earlier today about Jonathan Kahn coming out with this new book. That's exactly what that man does. It is, you know, whether or not he's been influenced by reform Judaism, I think he has. Uh, because I hear that tactic of the devil that's used in reform Judaism. God is a mystical God. This is how he acts as though God is a mystical God, as though we don't have access to him, as though we can just go through the word and we can just look at dates and, you know, oh, this is the date that such and such happened. And so this is going to be the date that that happens. And they're just putting a puzzle piece together. Why aren't they receiving that from God? Because you see what I do and I see what God does with me with regard to fulfilling end time prophecy, he reveals it to me. And most of the time, it's not something that I ever would have thought that that's what it was. The other day, I was reading to you from Daniel 11. And we were reading about the tax that's going to be imposed by the Antichrist. Who's the Antichrist? The Antichrist is papal Rome. What's the tax that they've imposed in order to maintain their splendor, in order to maintain their riches, their royal splendor? Well, huh. Let me see. A tax is usually a percentage of your income. A tenth? A tenth of your income, maybe? Because last I checked, the Messiah already came and he fulfilled, uh, he fulfilled sacrifice. So why are these, is this antichrist system of the harlot of Catholicism and the prostitutes that bore out of her through the Reformation, why are they still teaching you to engage in sacrifice? Why are they returning you back to the law? And more importantly, why are you doing it? Because at some point you have to ask the question, why am I doing this? It, what does this mean to me that I'm paying a tenth? At some point, if you have a heart for God, you're going to want to understand why. I have a friend who as a child asked her pastor, why does God need money? Huh? Pretty good question, isn't it? Because God never desired temples made by human hands. He never desired animal sacrifices. And he never desired your money. Everything's his. What do you think you're giving to him? Ultimately, what he wants is our heart. And the pastor never answered her question. All that to say that I, I, you know, you read about this tax, you read about it in the seals and you read about it in Daniel 11 and you think, okay, well, uh, you know, don't spill the olive oil and wine. All right. So are we going to be like put to work? Is it the recession that we're living in right now? Like, what is that? Well, Daniel 11 says that it is the tax that was impo imposed in order to maintain the royal splendor of the Antichrist that is papal Rome and the tax that's being imposed is tithing, what they are calling tithing. 
There's no tithing in the New Testament, guys. Paul never went around saying, hey, you need to give me a tenth so that I can continue in this ministry. You know what Paul said? He was so touched by the offering that they gave him, by the collection that they took up for him. And he said, you know, God, God provides for all my needs. So it's not that I require this in order to survive, but I desire that it be to your credit. He was so moved by what they did. He didn't, he, he, his attitude was not, well, this is what you're supposed to be doing anyway. Anytime that he was taking up a collection, it was to provide for the church, not a 10th. It was to provide for the church, to provide for the poor. But when something was being given to him, you see the, the posture that he had. You see the attitude that he took. Do you see that in churches today? No, they get up, they designate a certain point, a certain part of their service to guilt you into believing that you're required to pay this. They tell you stories too, right? Of the lady that put in the last two cents she had, gave all she had because they want to manipulate you into giving to her, into giving to that harlot. Now, let me ask you something. If I was reading scripture with my carnality or by my carnality, I was trying to put together puzzle pieces and dates and all these kinds of things that reform Judaism does, would I understand? No. These things are, are bestowed to me by God. And the reason they're bestowed to me is because my heart is pursuing him all day long and because of what I'm doing with you and because of what he set me apart to do. I'm not going out there selling books and claiming to be a prophet and fear mongering everyone while concurrently saying, don't be afraid. It's ridiculous. I'm also not exalting myself to the status of rabbi, prophet. I refer to myself as shepherd every time, don't I? We're all brothers and sisters. No one is to be exalted. When you love God's truth, when you use his language, when you pursue his heart with your heart, he's going to bestow understanding to you and it's not gonna be what you thought it was at all. That's what I've found that he reveals things to me and I'm like, oh my goodness, everybody looking for the temple in Jerusalem. I mean, how, how dumb, really? Like they're still at war. So when did you think that the foundations were gonna be laid? Where does it talk about the third temple in the New Testament? We're fitted together, we're being fitted together to become a holy temple to rise in the Lord. God does not dwell in temples made by human hands. Hmm, what's the temple? Do you see what I'm saying? Very important that we're using God's language, looking at how he used a concept in a sentence that we understand that what has been established in the Old Testament is fulfilled in the new, is being fulfilled, if not has already been fulfilled. But there are many things that are being fulfilled in the New Testament so that when we're looking at the New Testament and we're looking at things like revelation and, uh, you know, prophecy, we need to understand the fulfillment of that. When we're looking at the third temple in Ezekiel 9, we need to understand that he is talking about his people. He's not talking about a physical temple. If you know what the third temple is, then you know that he's talking about his people. If you don't understand the way that God has designed you, you don't understand his language, you don't understand his concepts, then be prepared to never understand how to heal and how to be saved, period. You will not be saved. You have to pursue his truth or you will be handed over to delusion. With all my heart, I pray that you will understand that. Thank you for listening. God bless you. And I'll see you in the next video.